The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. I've only learned a little bit, not a lot, uh, probably not as much as Glenn. So um, welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the Southeast Linux Fest for having me back this year um, to, uh, to do a talk. Um, this is actually a, uh, a slight update to a talk I gave last year. Um, also, it's a, somewhat of a condensation of that talk, um, which was on PyGTK. Uh, so uh, thanks you to, thank you to the self-organizers for having me back to, uh, to talk about this again, something near and dear to my heart, which is um, getting beginners uh, who are comfortable with scripting languages and maybe have been around uh, Linux for a while and been around free software for a while, but they're trying to make the jump to learning how a GUI works and uh, how you can write tools for yourself that uh, they use a graphical interface. So I'm going to be talking about uh, PyGObject, which is basically what you want to be using nowadays uh, instead of PyGTK. Um, how many people were at my talk last year? Anybody? Somebody there. Okay, so I, I would say probably 30% of this talk is new, and it's probably mostly about what PyGObject does, but the, uh, the concepts and, uh, uh, and, and a lot, in fact, a lot of the practice really remains the same. Um, is there anybody here who has not used a scripting language, something like Python or Bash or something like that? Is there anybody who has not used one of those? Okay, is there anybody here who's, who's not used Python in particular? Okay, only a couple. All right, that's, and that's fine. Um, obviously, I can't teach you Python in an hour, but I can point you to some great uh, learning um, resources for uh, Python. And in fact, I'm gonna, Drop over here to a browser and point you to one of my favorite uh, one of my favorite books. In fact, the book that I use to learn uh, the uh, beginning elements of Python. It's called "Dive into Python" by Mark Pilgrim. Uh, he's a, a great technical writer. Um, he's, in fact, he's one of the people that that I've I've read who has a really good knack for making highly technical stuff understandable to the novice. Um, and you will, in fact, be able to read this book even if you've never looked at Python before, um, and even if you're not uh, a, much of a programmer at all, and, uh, which I, I would definitely put myself in that category. So if you go to diveintopython.org, uh, you can actually read this book uh, online. You can download it for free. It might even be available in some of your distributions. In Fedora, we have it packaged. You can actually install it onto your system and read it live on your, uh, on your box. Um, you can download a PDF or other formats, or you can uh, support Mark and you can support his publisher uh, in making these sorts of free books available by buying a, a dead tree copy. So I don't know Mark, I don't get any money for saying that, I just honestly am a big fan of this book. So if you're looking to learn Python, I highly recommend that book. Um, it's, it's a great, great tutorial. Okay. So here's uh, basically the, the agenda. Um, I'm gonna give you some really, uh, really simple information for getting started. We're gonna talk about G-Object introspection and what it is, what it brings to the, the GUI table. Um, and then we're gonna dive into uh, how the GTK object model works. Um, whether we're talking about PyGObject or PyGTK, we're still talking about the GTK toolkit underneath. Um, the GTK toolkit is uh, it's a collection of widgets and definitions that allow you to build graphical interfaces that do useful things. And GTK, of course, is the uh, underlying technology under uh, tools like the GIMP and, of course, the GNOME 
uh, desktop environment uh, of which I'm a big fan. We'll talk about signals, which are the way that you actually hook these, uh, these widgets and objects uh, to actions that you want to happen when your user performs, uh, performs some task on the GUI. And then I'm gonna go through a simple example. Um, we're gonna go pretty quickly for, through the beginning of this because uh, I feel like the theoretical bits are not as important as kind of diving into some of the code and how it works. You are gonna see a little bit of Python here. Um, those of you who are Python experts, those of you who are GUI experts, uh, I, don't, I don't expect you're gonna pick up a lot of secrets here. Um, I'm not an expert programmer. I am, at best, uh, a, a bullheaded amateur, I guess, right? Able, I, I will uh, knock my head against a wall for hours to learn something that takes a good programmer a few minutes. Um, and so what I'm hoping I'm gonna do here is save people who, uh, who want to, to dive into GUIs. Um, I'm hopefully gonna save them a little of that, of that pain and a little of the, uh, the concussion uh, damage that I've sustained over my lifetime. All right, so we're gonna first talk a, a little bit about the tools that you need, how to get to the point where you can actually use GTK. Um, basically what you need in order to, to go a little further and, and start working with GUIs, you need a, a copy of Python on your system. You might also find that it's useful to have a, uh, a Python helper or wrapper, something like IPython. Uh, which I really like. It's sort of a more uh, user-friendly interactive shell, does a lot of useful things for you um, uh, beyond what the, the Python, uh, built-in Python command interpreter would do. Um, you're gonna want PyGObject, and that should be available basically on uh, just about every, uh, every platform out there. You're gonna want GTK, and I'm recommending because of, because of the way that G-Object Interspection works and the way, that, uh, the way that it leverages the power of the new GTK3, I'm recommending that uh, you would use uh, GTK3 or above. Um, right now, 3.0 is the latest stable version. 3.2, you know, I would imagine it's gonna be released at, at uh, some point months down the line. So 3.0 is what you can find nowadays uh, on, on most distributions. Um, certainly you can find that on, on Fedora. I believe the next open SUSE is gonna have GTK3 available as well. You'll want a text editor, right? And that can be at whatever you like. If you're a Vim guy, if you're an Emacs guy, if you're a gedit guy, doesn't matter. You just need a text editor. Um, you're also gonna want Glade, uh, Glade 3, which is the latest version of Glade. And uh, that, that version is actually compatible with uh, some of the uh, underlying technologies we're gonna be uh, showing in this, in this presentation. And I highly recommend DevHelp as well. Um, DevHelp is a tool that exposes the API and user documentation for these toolkits, things like GTK. So you can actually look at the definitions for different widgets, look at how they work. You can see examples of the functions uh, and methods that you can use with each of these uh, pieces of the toolkit. So it's very useful when you're getting started. Um, I find that uh, that I do refer to, to DevHelp quite a bit um, as an index for, you know, if I'm looking for a specific method, I'll look it up. And we're, we'll show off this tool and, and what it does in just a few minutes. So getting the tools is actually very simple. Um, for most distributions, just use your package manager of choice. If you're on um, Fedora or OpenSUSE, you'll use the AdRemove software tool. Uh, if you're on uh, Debian, uh, you'll use Apt or, uh, or you'll use Aptitude um, on, on Ubuntu and so on and so forth. The package names may be slightly different um, for, your, for your distribution of choice, um, but you're looking for these, co for these keywords. You're looking for GTK3, and especially the docs for development, right? If those are split out in your, uh, in your distribution's packaging, do grab the documentation because that actually interfaces with the dev help tool, and it automatically becomes part of your library of documentation that you can access through DevHelp. And of course, you also want PyG Object 2 and any documentation that comes along with that as well. All right, so how does the workflow work for putting together a GUI? <coughs> um, basically, it's pretty simple. You start by, well, I'm gonna assume that you have started by uh, deciding what the project that you're writing is going to do, right? What you want the user experience to be. Um, 
What do you want it to look like? What sort of interactions do you want the user to have? A lot of people, I think, make the mistake of you know, running right in and just you know, starting to code without thinking about you know, how you want that to look to the user, right? how you want their interaction to work. Um, you want it to be as simple as possible, as elegant as possible, and, and uh, make informed choices for the user, especially if you're doing something that you want to integrate with an environment like, like GNOME that's designed for simplicity and ease of use. But basically, you can use the Glade tool to design the UI. Now, this, this does not require that you have code written to begin with. You can actually use Glade to make, essentially, a mock-up for your interface. Right? You can lay in a, a dialogue, you can put buttons in it, you can put entry fields, without worrying about the code that's actually going to run that stuff and, uh, and make it do things. The code can be written afterward. Now, when you write that stuff in, in Glade, um, it does, Glade does give you a, a choice of how it's going to write that resource file out. Nowadays, the recommended way to do that is write it out as GTK Builder. I think the other choice is libglade. Libglade is um, sort of the older compatibility library. It's kind of deprecated now, so GTK Builder is the default. If you're writing anything new, that's what you want to choose. When you save that project, what actually gets saved is an XML file that defines the interface defines all the widgets, um, where they lie, it defines the properties about them, how wide a certain text field is. Uh, if you've labeled a button, the label text will be in there as well. And you can actually tweak that XML file. You can do it in Glade uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you get really familiar with the toolkit. I'm not one of those people, but if you get really familiar with the toolkit, you can actually go into the, uh, the XML file and just make changes manually as you would any other sort of text file. Now, to make that file actually do anything, to make that, that interface actually function, what you're going to do is load it in your Python program as a resource, right? You're going to say, hey, I've got this builder file out here. I'm, I need to load that. And then I'm going to start actually defining what happens in my program when the user interacts with, an, with a piece of that interface in a certain way. So for example, if I know that I have a button that's marked close, and I want, when, a, when the user clicks that close button, I want the, the program to close, I need to define that in my Python code, right? And the way I do that, well, we'll go over how that works in, in just a little bit, but you would actually write that into your code. So those functions get called based on the interactions that you choose, right? And it can get pretty granular. We're ta we'll talk about that when we get to signals in just a moment. All right, this is a little bit, it's a little bit theoretical, but is everybody following me, following me so far? Does this make sense? Okay. Um, and please, you know, feel free if you have questions, you know, shout if you, if there are a lot of them at once, maybe we might have to have hands raised, but, you know, feel free to shout out a question and I'll, uh, and, uh, and, and I'll do my best to answer you. Okay, so, on to G-Object uh, introspection. Um, this is a, uh, when I talk about G-I-R, that's the G-Object introspection repository, which you'll see when you get into writing code. So um, my joke here is who died and left you king, right? How is it that, how is it that Pi G-Object is now, you know, the new hotness? Uh, what happened to PyGTK? Wasn't that the good stuff? Well, it, it's always been very good, and so I'm not denigrating the project at all when I call it the old stuff. You know, it's kind of the old busted. Um, it's not that old and busted, and it's fa in fact very stable, and it, and it still is very useful. A lot of uh, platforms still have the GTK2.x toolkit, um, probably something like you know 2.28 uh, or above, but. Um, but even the PyGTK project is recommending that people migrate their code to, P, to PyG object. So why is that? Well, because PyGTK was essentially a Python project that was written directly on top of GTK as a, as a compatibility, um, or I'm sorry, as a, as a, uh, a set of bindings for, for the libraries so you could use Python with, uh, uh, um, to, to actually use the, the toolkit. But the problem with doing that is that every time the underlying toolkit changed, PyGTK had to change as well, right? Had to be changed directly. Um, and it doesn't scale well, right? I mean, every time, the, every time one upstream changes, the other upstream's gotta, gotta make a bunch of changes and had to coordinate releases and things like that. Not much fun, right? And it, and it can kind of slow the momentum of both projects. So 
What, um, what's being used now is G-object introspection. And essentially what this is, is a thin, it's a thin layer of glue that allows the, the uh, library, including, the, the libraries including GTK, but not only GTK, but other libraries like glib and GIO that are all part of uh, the G-object, the larger G-object ecosystem. Um, it allows them basically to expose the C, the, the, the bits that are written in the C programming language um, underneath. And it does it in such a way that now a Python uh, piece of code can actually talk to the thin layer of G-object introspection and whatever functions have been changed, whatever things happen under, in the underlying GTK library, immediately are visible and usable in Python without any extra work on the programmer's part, right? Um, and in fact, uh, without any extra work on the, uh, on the part of people who are working on introspection, without any more work on the part of people who are writing P, uh, Pi G object. So they can actually concentrate on making their code better, not worrying about the underlying library as much. Um, also, the other thing that the GI, the, the GI repository does is it makes it possible to add bindings for other languages very, very easily um, by simply tying them into the, to the G object introspection. So it's just a way of making things work better, right? More scalably, more as a more fluid development. The uh, the different parts of the community that are working on these underlying bits, all those guys who are you know great programmers who are actually writing the bits that make make it possible for other programmers to do stuff. They don't have to uh, they don't have to to worry so much about coordinating their timing and, and the work that they're doing, they can simply worry about moving forward faster and doing, a, uh, doing all of the, uh, the uh, enhancements and, and uh, fixes that they want to do for their, their toolkit. So that's, that's basically how G-Object works. I mean, this is kind of a picture. So you, know, you can glue pretty much any sort of language on top of it, Python, Vala, you know, some other language. Um, can all use G-Object introspection and immediately get all the benefits. Whenever GTK changes, those functions will immediately be exposed through the G-Object introspection to those languages. All right, so that's for the more, maybe the more developer uh, 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 propeller beanie heads, I guess, who are in here who know a lot more about this stuff than I do. Um, for the rest of us, though, so what? Well, nothing, really. I mean. There is no so what. I mean, that was interesting for, you know, I think people who, who are interested in toolkits and how these libraries work. But if you're like me, if you're more of an, you know, a like I said, a dedicated or a bullheaded amateur, um, this, all this stuff really doesn't matter that much unless you need to port existing code. I'm not going to cover that here, but I will show you some resources where you can find information on how to port your PyGTK code to PyGObject. It's actually quite simple. Um, if you're a beginner, though, here's what you might want to get out of what I just talked about for a few minutes, which is that when you look at code and people are talking about PyGTK, just realize that you're looking at something that was probably written a while back, and it's increasingly deprecated over time, right? It's increasingly becoming obsolete, so, and, and even possibly plain wrong, right? So you won't necessarily be able to follow those instructions you know, many years in the future if you're trying to write to a toolkit like GTK3. Right, you really want to concentrate on using PyG object instead. If you are interested in specific stuff about PyGTK, you can look at the, uh, my last year's uh, talk, either at Self or the Ohio Linux Fest, and I've got information in there about that is very PyGTK specific. So if you're still using that and you're looking for more information specifically about PyGTK, um, you can visit that talk. All right. So now I'm going to start talking a little bit about the real nitty gritty about how, uh, how, to, how to actually start writing code and how to understand the GTK toolkit. Not all the ins and outs, right? I'm not qualified to give you that, but I, but I hopefully can um, give those folks in here who are beginners, again, trying to make that, that jump, give you a little bit of a flavor for how you can learn to figure this stuff out a lot more easily than, than it came to me. All right, so when we talk about the toolkit, the, the GTK toolkit, um, there's an underlying object model in GTK, which is based on something that's probably pretty familiar to people who uh, have worked in object-oriented languages, right? Um, Python's an example of an object-oriented language. GTK has an object model that will be you know, familiar to people who know those concepts. 
It's based on the idea of classes and inheritance. So when, uh, when you, you instantiate an object, uh, or actually, actually let, me, let me step back before I get into the, the, the big words there. Um, every class of an object has some sense of um, definition around it, right? We attach properties to it, and there are, there are things that, uh, that are, are characteristics for that class. Right? So an example would be you know, this chair object that I've, that I've written up here. If you look at one of these chairs, right? Um, a chair is, uh, it's, it's a thing, but there's also an idea of a chair that we have in our, in our minds. Even if a chair is not sitting in front of you, when I say chair to you, you know what I'm talking about, right? There's an idea of a chair, and I probably could get you know, really lost in a in a, uh, a lecture on, on metaphysics from my college days, and we could talk about you know, the ideas of Plato's Republic and all that, but the important stuff here really is that that idea is different than an instance, right? An actual chair. The idea of a chair is one thing, right? That you can think of that like a class. And the object itself, or what we call an instance, is maybe that actual chair there in the front row here. Um, the idea of a chair has properties that we can attach to it. Like if you were to imagine a chair, that chair would have some location in reality. Um, uh, it might have a, a, you know, the, a property of whether it's you know, upholstered or not. Um, maybe how many legs it has, right? Some chairs have four legs. Maybe there, there are some other ones out there that have five or you know, they sit on a spindle or something like that. Um, and then if you think about it, there are all sorts of subclasses of chairs that you can imagine. For example, let's imagine a class called a folding chair, which has the same properties as any other chair, but maybe it has some additional properties as well. Like for example, you can fold a folding chair, whereas I could not fold this more generic chair that's up here in the front row, um, which has uh, fixed legs. A swivel chair might be a, a different kind of subclass that has a, a rotate function. You can actually sit and spin on the swivel chair. Um, as my kids tend to do in my office when I'm not around. So, um, so those are some, that's, that's I guess a, a nice easy way to think about classes and inheritance, right? These classes have properties and methods attached to them. You can subclass one of these classes and add additional methods and properties that only apply to that subclass, but it also inherits all of the uh, methods and properties of the class above it. Now, here's an example of how that works in GTK itself, all right? So it's, it's not important that you memorize any of this stuff, it's just an example to show you how this hierarchy works. Let's imagine a button, right? The class GTK button is a push button widget. It's the widget that actually makes a button on the screen and when you click on it, it allows you to interact with, uh, with a GUI program. That GTK button is actually several subclasses down in hierarchy from higher level objects. So the GTK button is actually a subclass of the bin, and a GTK bin is basically a widget that contains something, but it only contains one other thing, right? And the reason that, that bin, it might seem odd to have something that can only contain one other thing, but it does make sense when you, uh, when you start thinking about the space that an object occupies, uh, what, how that space interacts with the space around other things and so forth. So that bin is a subclass of a container, where a container, whereas a bin can only have one thing in it, a container can have many other things, right? So you could imagine you know, a container having several bins, each of those bins having another type of widget in them. The container is a subclass of the even more generic widget, which basically just means something useful in, in the GTK tool class. I'm sorry, toolkit, excuse me. Um, and that's actually a subclass of a G object, which is an incredibly, incredibly abstract idea, right? G, you can't even, I mean, a G object is not even something I really can describe to you. It's basically a, a basic class that has some very, very fundamental methods and properties that are needed basically by anything in the GTK toolkit. And that G object is not really as useful for, uh, for most programmers on its own, especially not when you're getting started. As you get further along, you do find uses for that, but we're not gonna talk about them today.
So, okay, that's useful, but obviously I'm not gonna take the next you know, 40 minutes and describe every single member of the toolkit for you, right? That will be a waste of your time. The toolkit is actually fully described in the documentation. So what I'm gonna show you is how to bring that documentation up and actually look through it yourself so you can actually see how, these, uh, how this inheritance works and how the, uh, how the methods and properties work. So this is, this is DevHelp. So I'm, I'm gonna look up the GTK button in DevHelp. Now I, actually, I actually have it called up already here. Uh, this is the DevHelp program. And I'm gonna run down to the GTK3 reference manual. And we're gonna call up the uh, list of widgets and objects. Actually, they have a full object hierarchy here, which we're gonna call up. This is basically everything in the toolkit, all the different kinds of widgets and, and objects that you can use. And what I'm gonna do is look for GTK button, and there it is. So we're gonna call this up, and notice how helpful this is, right? We, we, get a, we, we get an explanation of what the button is, we even have a nice little picture showing us an example. Um, and then there's a bunch of code. Now if you're a fledgling programmer like me, when you open this, this tool, this is very scary, right? Because this is exactly what I don't know how to do when I'm starting out, right? And what I'm gonna tell you is that as a, as a beginning programmer, there's not much in here that you, need, that you need to worry about to begin with, right? Let's look at just the object hierarchy for now, and you'll see how outlined here in the documentation is exactly what I just showed you in the slides, which is that a GTK button is a subclass of the bins, which is a subclass of the container, which is a subclass of the widget, which is actually a subclass of another thing called this initially unknown, which is, again, very abstract, not important, um, which is a subclass of gobject. Now, looking at this dev help, you actually can find out all of the different things that, uh, that a, a button is capable of. So a button, for example, if we look at its properties, a button may have a label, right? And that label is just a piece of text that sits on the button that is hopefully instructive to the user about what they're going to do. But keep in mind, these properties do not, this does not represent the entire list of properties uh, uh, for a button, right? Because the button has inherited everything from up the line. So for example, we could look at the GTK widget properties Let's hit the properties link here. And you'll see that these properties, oops, sorry, these properties are uh, things that all widgets are capable of. And that means that a button, which is a subclass of a widget, even if it's several, several steps down the line, inherits all of these as well. So for example, um, sensitive, right? That, that sensitive uh, uh, property is just a, uh, it's a yes or a no. Can this object be interacted with by the user, right? Is it, gonna, is it going to uh, be sensitive to motion over it or clicking or something like that, right? So that means that this sensitive property is something that all widgets have, including buttons. Does that make sense so far? All right. I know this seems like I'm really haranguing this, but believe me, this, this was, when, it, when you start getting the, the, uh, the hierarchy and the inheritance down in your head, you really start to be able to navigate around this help, this help system and start to find all of the different functions and different properties that you need for making your GUI do something useful. So when you don't find those things in the particular, uh, the very particular subclass you're looking at, like a button, you can go up the line and look for the property or the function that you're interested in, right? And when you locate that, as long as it's in the inheritance, in the ancestry for that, for that widget, then you can use that as well, okay? All right. <clears throat> so I've shown you a little bit about dev help and, and, uh, and how that works. And, and, I, and by the way, I did show you properties. What I didn't show you were methods, but Methods essentially are things that a, a widget can do, right? They're, or they are things that can occur, right, that are attached to that widget. Um, like, for example, uh, hiding that widget or showing that widget, 
All right. So now that we've gone through that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about signals. Signals are really um, the, the heart of user interaction when you're writing a, a program in a GUI. Um, when you run your, uh, your GUI program, essentially what's happening is at some point or other, after you've done whatever preparatory steps are needed in your program, you're going to start something called the main loop, right? The GTK main loop, or I, sh I should say, the, I guess it's the glib the G -lib main loop. Um, and that main loop is exactly what it sounds like. It's essentially just a loop in which your, uh, your application is waiting for receipt of information from the user, right? Things like, you know, did the mouse, mo the mouse moved over a piece of the interface, right? That would actually be caught by the main loop. You could do something with it if you wanted, but, uh, you know, generally, you know, movement isn't maybe as, as important to you as something like a click, right? But you can pick and choose which of those input, which of those interactions are gonna become input for your program. So for example, you may not care uh, if somebody moves their mouse over your button, right? That may not matter to you. But you may be interested in if they actually, if they click on your button. But those choices are available to you, right? It gets very, very granular. In fact, it's not just the fact they clicked on a button. If you cared about it, you could have your program react by doing something when they press the button down and something else when they, let, when they release the button, right? You can do things like when the, when the mouse cursor goes over the board, slips over the border of that element, that button, something could happen then. When it leaves the border, something could happen, right? So there's a lot of very, very granular events. But you know, the, the, the main ones that people use are gonna be the obvious ones. Like for a button, uh, you would attach a signal to the clicked event. Right? When the button is clicked, you want something to happen. And a click basically consists of somebody pressing the button and then releasing it. <clears throat> so that interaction generates a signal that's caught by the main loop. Now, that doesn't mean that anything necessarily is going to happen unless you catch the signal by connecting some function to it. Right? And that's called a callback. Right? And what happens is you'll say that when this button is clicked, I want a callback to happen to this function, right? And that function is going to make my application do something, right? And that's really the, that's really the essence of, of how, the, uh, how the interaction process works. Um, you know, you might want something to happen if somebody fills in a checkbox. Let's, let's, uh, here's, here's a good example. Um, there's a certain kind of widget called a label, right, which is just a piece of text. And you can declare a property for that label uh, I'm trying to remember what the name for it is. I thought it was active, but I'm not sure anymore. Um, but there's a property that determines whether that label is, you know, is, is written in stan a standard coloring, you know, appears like probably black on gray, or whether it's kind of grayed out and unavailable. Everybody's seen that, right, in an interface where you have a couple labels or controls that are grayed out and you can't do anything with them, right? One form of interaction might be you might want uh, when, when the user selects a checkbox, puts a check in the box, you might, want the, you might want the property for those labels to change so that they're now available. You guys have probably seen that from a user perspective. You've seen that happen. Well, that's an example of catching the signal of making the checkbox active. When the checkbox becomes active, do the following things. Uh, the, the, the following widgets now need to be uh, made active or, or sensitive or whatever the, the case is for that, that property, right? And you'd also want to catch the opposite, which is when the checkbook, when the checkbox is turned off, that those things get grayed out again, right? Or you could, you could make them vanish even, right? You could make your, your dialogue actually hide that whole part of the, the interface so that your interface, you know, opens up when you click the checkbox and then when you turn it off, the, the interface closes up. Okay, so those are different ways that you can, that you can use signals. Now, um, I'm actually gonna show you um, a little bit later here some examples of how that works in real life. So 
How do you do this in Python, though? I mean, this is, this is all, I, hopefully this is all information that's fairly useful, right, for you guys if you're, if you're starting GUIs. Hopefully that's, that's given you an idea that, you know, this stuff is not, it's not as much rocket science as, as maybe that you're, you're afraid of. I know that I was very afraid of writing GUIs for a long time. And uh, when I finally realized how these things work, um, you know, it just opened up this whole, this whole new vista. So how, how can we make this part of our Python program? Well, to use, for example, the GTK library, it's very simple. You load it using the, the gobject introspection repository. From gi.repository, import GTK. Right? For those of you who aren't Python programmers, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Basically, we're loading a module of code that we're going to be using. Um, the next thing we do is we create a, G, a GTK builder object. Remember I talked about GTK builder a little while ago? What was, what was uh, you know, I, I, when I talked about that, I talked about it in the, in the sense of um, creating, uh, creating a resource that we're gonna load. What was that resource, anybody? XML yeah. yeah. Have a thumb drive. Um, yeah, absolutely, it's an XML file. And what, what's gonna happen is, in Python, we're going to create a, G, a GTK Builder object, or I should say an, an instance of the GTK Builder class, and we're gonna populate it by saying, hey, load the definition that's in this file on the file system, and then it's gonna have a whole tree of objects. Those objects all have names, and those names are the way that we can refer to them uh, later on in our program. So that's what I'm doing with this piece of Python code here. Now, it's gonna get, this is gonna get a little hairy to explain if you're, not, if you're not already using Python. Those of you who have used Python, hopefully this, this is not difficult to understand. We're just saying that when we start up, uh, when we start up our, 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 uh, our object here, our, our class, maybe it's a, uh, a UI class that we've declared. When we initialize it, um, we create a, a property, this builder property, by instantiating a gtk.builder object. That basically means create a gtk.builder object, right? There's nothing in it yet, it's just, a, it's just a, holding, a holding place right now. To populate it, we add the, we add the contents of the probe.ui file. Okay, so we'll add that in, and now our gtk.builder object actually has content in it. Now we can start referring to the things that are inside that builder file using the self.builder object. Right. And uh, this is how we would do that. Remember I, I described that at, when we load in that tree of objects, they all have names, right? Those names are assigned automatically, by the way, by Glade, right? If you write your own builder file from scratch, you have to be careful to make sure that you, you know, don't use the same name for two objects or else you'll get an error when you try and load the file. Glade generally takes care of that stuff for you. It will tell you when there's a problem like that. And if you let it, it will simply assign all the names itself. And they have wonderful descriptive names like button one and button two, right? So I, I usually try and make the naming you know, something that I'll take care of. After I, after I make that, that mock-up, that UI, I'll make those names descriptive in some way. You know, like I'll call my close button close. Right? Makes it easier to remember when I'm writing my Python code later that that's the, that's the name of the object. So <clears throat> how, do we, how do we do something with, uh, for example, a button that is part of that tree of objects? Well, um, again, using our UI class, this self object, we declare something called a close button, close underscore button, and that close button equals the object that is named close, and we do that using this get object uh, method. Does this make sense for those of you who are, are Python folks? Does this kind of make sense to you? All right, so all we've done is we've assigned that, that, that GTK button, that, ob, that widget, to the self.close button. And then we can start doing things with that. All right, so how do we put all this stuff together? How do we make something useful out of this? So I'm gonna show you a simple example putting together the concepts that we just talked about into an incredibly uh, simple and pretty useless little program. It's basically uh, one step up from Hello World, but it's simple enough that we can go through it quickly. And it'll show us how you can take text entry from a dialogue 
and then I'm doing something dumb with it, which is just outputting the text on the command line. I'm not, I'm not trying to make the case that that's something you're gonna want to often do, but it should show you that if you, if you can take something from the GUI and then have that output to a terminal, and that should open up hopefully a whole realm of possibilities in your mind. I mean, you could do anything with that text. You could write a bit of Python code in your, in your callback function that would, you know, email it to somebody or, you know, uh, I don't know, might take it as the name for a, a, a server that you want to connect to and then do some sort of function there. All right, so this is just a really, really simple example um, to show you, you know, the following things. Win uh, a window button is in the text entry. I'm gonna sh it'll show you how the window is deleted and this, how we catch a signal uh, on specific buttons, and it'll show you that main loop at work, okay? So let's go take a look at it. Oh, by the way, actually, before we, before we look at that, let's look at, um, let's actually look at the, um, the Glade file. So here's the Glade file for this, this easy program. You know, again, we're looking at the user interface, not the Python code. So this is just a very, very simple dialog. It's got a label up here, it's got a text entry box, and it's got a couple buttons, close and print. Right? And when we look at these things, I'm gonna pull this out so it's a little easier to see here. When you look at one of these items, like for example, the dialog, it has a number of properties that you can adjust down here. Right? whether it's resizable or not, I have it set to yes, although you know, if I were writing a, a program for something like this, it might not be a yes, you know, I could change those things. Modal, you know, whether or not it sticks in front of everything else, whether you want it to or not. Um, you can set position, you can set an icon for it. There's all sorts of things that you can, that you can set here. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these. I, I will tell you that one of the, one of the things that you'll, you'll start doing when you design these GUIs is you'll use a lot of one particular widget, which is, uh, well, actually a couple of the kinds of widgets, which are uh, these rows and columns and, 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 and tables, right? Or I think they call them HBox, VBox, and, and table. Um, those are ways that you can lay out your interface in a nice, neat way, right? There, fortunately, you don't have to do that for every single kind of dialogue out there, right? If you're, say you wanna have an about dialogue, for your GUI, right? Everybody wants that, right? You hit help about, and a dialogue comes up and tells you the program name, copyright, you know, maybe it has a link to the website or whatever. You don't have to write that stuff from scratch. A lot of those dialogues that you see every day are already written for you. So for example, like, uh, where, let's see if I can find it. Where's the assistant, or where's the, where's my about, there it is, right? This about dialogue lets you actually create an about dialogue very simply, and you can populate it either by filling out the Glade or you can populate it from your Python program. All right. So let's do this. Um, I'm going to load up. And I'm gonna, let me um, adjust the, I'm gonna adjust the font size here just to make sure people can see it in the back there. should work, and oh, not there, let's try this. Do, 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 do. Oops, sorry, my fault. Bad typing. I'm going to open up this Python program, right, so we can see, so we can see how this works. Actually, let, you know, even just to make it simple, let me just run that program, so you can get an idea of what it does before we start looking at the code behind it. All right, all it does is it generates this little dialog, right? It's the same thing we saw in the Glade program, right? And it gives an instruction here, right? And if we Watch the, if you take, keep an eye on this terminal up here, we'll just put in some, and you'll see that when I hit print, the text outputs on the terminal, right? And then I can hit close, program is gone, okay? All right, so that's very simple. Obviously, you know, it's not a lot of bells and whistles um, we have, because we have a limited, uh, limited amount of time here, but 
you'll find that there are quite a number of, of applications on pretty much every Linux distribution that are written in Python using the GTK library, right? So you can probably look at some of the code of, for simple programs on your own system and get an idea of some of the more complex things. But let's go through this one and just, you know, to make it nice and easy, we'll, we're gonna go through this line by line. So what we do at the beginning here, um, I do an import, which I, I'm just used to doing. I, I do that with most of my, most of my Python programs, which is, you know, this OS and Sys, because I'm gonna use at least OS down below. I uh, probably could have left off Sys, but whatever. And then here's that line that I told you about before, from gi.repository import GTK. We do that because we're going to use the GTK toolkit in this, in this Python program. And then I set up a UI. Now, I did this as a class, right, and which I'm then going to instantiate. It's not required that you do that. I mean, you could actually just write this more as a script and build the thing from a script. But I feel like this is a better way to show Python than the other way, right? This will, this will take you further in life, right? Understanding how this works. So I have a UI class which I initialize. And you, this, this should look pretty familiar, right? We just went over the same thing here, which is we, inst we instantiate a builder object and then we, we add the content to it from our file. Um, now notice my, my add from file is a little goofy here because what I'm doing is saying, Oh, get the current working directory and whatever that path is, add easyentry.ui to it. So it's gonna add that from my, my current directory. Um, I did that for a specific reason, it's not important here, but just understand that all I'm doing there is essentially the same thing, loading in the definitions. Then I declare something called self.window. And what's that gonna be? Well, whatever object is called dialog1 is now, when I talk about self.window, it's that widget. In fact, that is, that is the entire dialog. Then I declare something called close button, which is attached to, you know, that's actually populated from whatever the close button object was. Similarly with print button, similarly with entry, right? All I'm doing is attaching these things to Python objects, right? I'm making a Python object out of each of these widgets. Why? Because then I can refer to that Python object, I can refer to its, its properties and methods and actually use them in my program. So for example, for the window, I'm going to connect. Now this connect method is something that you can do with most, with, with any, any kind of widget. That connect is a method that uh, it's attached to very, very high up the hierarchy, very high up the, sub, uh, up the class tree, right? And what I'm doing is a delete event. Uh, I'm attaching to the delete event. If somebody hits the X, the, the, little, the little close button for that window, or if, the, or if the window is deleted for some other reason, then this, the quit function is going to run for this UI. Um, similarly, if somebody connect, and I'm gonna skip a line here, if somebody uh, clicks the close button object, the quit, the quit function will also run then, right? This is kind of important because what you'll find is when you run one of these applications, if you don't attach something like that, you can't get the GUI to go away unless you like sig kill your application itself. So it's, and the reason that's interesting is that once I understood why that was, again, it was like one of those little doors opened. When you create these, these, tool, these, uh, these interfaces, these dialogues and things, they all exist. They all exist whether you can see them or not, right? They're in memory. They're there whether they're visible or not. The act of making them visible is something that you actually have to do, right? And you would make certain certain parts of your builder object, that is, you know, maybe this dialogue or that dialogue, you make them appear at specific times depending on what you want, right? That kind of like, I don't know, that, I don't know about you guys, that kind of blew my mind when I learned it. Maybe I'm just, I may be the stupidest person in the room though, so. Um, that was something that I really, like I really dug that, that um, the fact that making those things going, go away, making the main loop stop, right? Making these different dialogues appear and disappear and knowing that they're all there all the time and it's just a matter of which ones you expose and make available for people to use, that's, it's such a powerful concept. And when you realize that, that those things are always there and it's just a matter of you as a programmer deciding how the user is going to interact with them, I mean, the, 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 the possibilities are limitless, right? It also helps you understand that these functions that you write in Python are little bits of code that only run when somebody does whatever that, that when they produce that signal, right? 
So you can build all sorts of really cool functions and not worry about, you know, uh, you don't need to worry about some abstract connection between the dialogue that's in front of you and where your Python program is running, right? You don't have to think about it that way. You simply think that when I, when I do this thing, when the user does this thing, this, the following callback function is going, to, is going to run. So to follow that up, let's, you know, let's look at this, this line I skipped, which is the print button's connect function. When the print button object is clicked, we're gonna run this function called print text. All right, so now we've got several functions that we've connected, and here they are right down here. They're very simple. I have a print text, that print text function that we, that we looked at here. There's the actual function itself. I use this star args because it is actually possible to send arguments into that function that you could, you know, some arbitrary arguments that you could use in your Python program later. I'm not actually um, using them. Um, what happens is I simply print at the terminal some text. Where do I get the text? Well, I'm referring back to the self.entry object, which is that, that little text entry box, and I'm doing, a, I'm actually running a method the, dot, the get text method, which basically does exactly what it sounds like, gets the text that's in the entry box, and that, uh, that's now what we're referring to. So that string object gets printed out. Does that make sense? All right. And there's our quit function, uh, which is obviously not a lot of fun. Basically, when it quits, it runs the GTK main quit, which basically breaks the main loop. Once that main loop is broken, your GUI program is gone. Right? Your, or your, your GUI pieces are gone. You're no, longer, you're no longer getting, or I should say, you're no longer getting signal data at that point, right? It's, uh, when, you, when you do that, if, you ha if there's nothing further happening after the main loop, the program is gonna quit and all of those resources are gone. It is actually possible to quit out of the main loop but not have anything further happen, like your program would basically look like it was locked, right? It just stopped. The GUI went away, for example, and, but yet the person doesn't get a prompt back, right, or something like that. It's possible to do that, so you, you do wanna make sure to clean up after yourself um, in, in those kind of programs. Here it's actually very simple because when I run this, this Python program, I only do two things, really. Remember that all of this stuff up here, none of this is actually stuff that runs when I start the Python program until I instantiate this class, right? I make a UI object, which is an instance of this class UI. When I instantiate it, all of this stuff happens. The builder stuff is, is loaded, the signal connections are made, these functions are defined but not run, right? And that all happens when I do this. The next thing I do is I start the main loop. That's it. So what I've done is I've, I've essentially, I've, I've built a dialogue and I run it, okay? And when it's done, when that main quit happens, this loop, this, this, this function here, which is essentially just a loop, when that's over, there's no more program, that's it. So that's why everything quits when I, when I you know, click on the close button or click on the, uh, the X uh, on the dialogue. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, I know this is a very simple example, not incredibly useful, but you can actually pick apart any PyGTK or PyG object uh, GUI program using this stuff, okay? So where does that leave us? Um, just remind you about the program flow. Um, you have an XML file that defines the GUI elements you're gonna use. You load, them in, uh, you load them into a gtk.builder object with your Python code, and then you continue to refine the GUI and assign interactivity through other functions that you set up. Now, a couple notes. You don't need to write everything in the UI file. You don't need to label every button. You don't need to label every single widget. You can actually do that stuff in your Python program. Why is that important? because you might want to change it as the program goes, right? As you run, like here's an example. I have an about dialogue for a program that I wrote. When I change the version number from 0.4 to 0.5, I don't want to find all of the labels where I have an 0.4 and change them. So I set that in an overall definition that, you know, that the, the my Python program uses, and then I actually programmatically set the label in the about dialogue to be zero, you know, that, 
the content of that variable. That way I only have to change it in one place and anywhere the version number is used in my program, it automatically changes, right? And of course you could build that into your, you know, your building scripts and all sorts of other automation you could do. Um, you can hide or show elements dynamically. Um, I have a fairly simple uh, program that I wrote called Pulsecaster, which you can get. I know you can get it in Fedora. I think in OpenSUSE. I think you can get it in Ubuntu now. But if not, go to pulsecaster.org. You can download the code. It's incredibly simple. I would not call it a paragon of great programming. So don't, don't use it as a Bible, for God's sake. But you will hopefully find it a little bit instructive on what a bullheaded amateur can achieve um, given enough time and enough caffeine. All right, so um, at the end here, I, I don't want to apologize to Burt Bacharach for butchering his lyrics for my, my little slides. Um, and I'm going to note that PyG object does not make anything harder than PyGDK. If you're starting out, it really doesn't matter. You're, all you're doing is learning a couple, uh, a couple new ways of addressing objects, but it's, it's really no different than PyGDK. Um, if you're going to write something, try contributing to something before you reinvent a wheel. There's a lot of GUI programs out there. There's a lot of bad GUI programs out there. So um, see if you can contribute to something that you like um, to, to help out. And if you're doing something new, remember, code last. Right? Design, design what you want your users to see. Figure out their experience first. Write the code as the last step. All right, now um, I think I've got a few minutes for questions, right? And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for hanging out here with me, and uh, I'll take whatever questions you have. Yeah? So can you download the sample program of that URL? Yes, absolutely. The presentation that you're looking at is under the self-2011 folder in my, uh, in my Fedora people space. You can also download the program, the UI file, everything. And in fact, even the, the diagram I did, you can download the, the SVG for that if you want. Yeah, that's, and I, there's some other stuff up there which may or, you may or may not find useful. You know, maybe you can laugh at it, I guess, if it's, some of it's kind of out of date. So <laughs> I don't clean that space often. Yes? I'm sorry, if I'd not... Oh, okay, so the question was, how, how much more difficult would the example have been if I didn't start with Glade? Um, actually, in terms of complexity, not, not a lot more complex. Um, but w if you don't use Glade, you basically have to set up the, the tree of objects yourself. So you have to set up a dialogue, you have to declare you know, what kind of buttons are in it, you have to declare you know, these vertical boxes, the things that are going to be in them, set the labels for text. Those are all things that basically Glade is a shortcut it's basically a GUI for making GUIs, right? It just shortens your time to, your time to develop. Um, but you absolutely could do that in the program. Like in, the, in, the, in that init, that, uh, that initialization function, I could have done all of that manually using Python code. I could have said, you know, make a GTK dialog, uh, you know, fill it up with the following things, then pack the, pack the rows and, and, and that sort of stuff. I, I find that's a pain. People who write Python who have come from the C world of doing um, GTK or doing GUIs, a lot of times they do that because they're so used to doing it in C that they just do it all the time. I, I find Glade much easier to, to start with. Helps me get my ideas, I guess, into practice faster. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, really good. I'm just going to repeat that for the camera so it picks it up. Um, uh, a really good point that the nice thing about when you actually write that code out longhand as opposed to using Glade, it gives you a lot more um, control at a granular level over all of the things that, that, your, uh, that your GUI is made up. Like every component becomes a little more tunable, like more easily. But, um, you know, again, the, the beginner thing, I think Glade is great for beginners. As you, get, as you get more advanced, you may decide that you're going to start doing more of it by hand. So... Um, it's definitely uh, it's definitely up to you. Um, I find that the you know Glade's like just a low barrier to entry uh, idea for me. Yeah. Anybody else? 
Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. You guys. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.